I think as long as we're attacking enigmas, it'd be a good idea for us to just shoot to the stars. Let's solve the enigma of the universe. Here you can see an image of my colleague Dave and I. We both work on the Large Hadron Collider and we really enjoy talking to the public, obviously, about what we do. Here we were hosting a virtual visit of some students about 12 and 13 years old. They were joining us from Seward, Alaska. And this gives them a chance, these virtual visits give them a chance to sort of ask scientists, what's it all about? What are you guys doing over there smashing particles together? Sometimes, the best questions, in fact, most of the time, the best questions come from young people. How do we measure what we can't see? I think if I try to answer that question here, we'll make a big leap towards understanding the enigma of the universe. So let's give it a try. I think we can do it. What is it that we see right now when we look at the universe? I'm going to show it to you. Are you ready? There you go. Nothing, 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 nothing. Something, intergalactic gas. Nothing, 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 nothing. More interstellar gas. Nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Oh, that's us. Wait. That's us. That's us. It's our galaxy. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. Nada, nada. Sorry, nada, nada. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> Interstellar gas. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing. So you guessed it. The universe, exactly what you expected it was. A dark fear. <laughs> What we all expect. Uh, it's 96 percent stuff that we can see. There's only that small four percent at the top of the things that we are able to see. So when a particle physicist tells you they're doing a really good job, remind them that they're missing 96 percent of the universe. So let's try to solve some of that if we can. How do we know this? How do we see what we do see? How do we know what the universe is made of? Well, this tool has been serving us extremely well since the beginning of mankind. For millions of years, we've been using this, and it's an amazing tool. The human eye can see to one one hundredth of a degree in precision. That means that we can look at my colleague Eva's uh, hair. She has very fine blonde hair. That's why I chose her for this. About 40 microns, don't ever say that us guys aren't observant, okay? 40, about 40 microns uh, her hair is. You can't go much better than that, that's pretty good precision that's for something that's up close. But we can also see something very, very far away, 2.5 million light years away, there's this galaxy out there called Andromeda, and we can see that with our bare eyes. We don't need anything more. So we're happy, right? Good enough? Now we're human beings, human beings, have this insatiable desire to know more. It's just what we're made out of, that's what drives us, that's how we survive. We need to learn more about the world around us. We want to know the answers to many questions. Where did we come from? What are we made of? Are there rules that govern all of this? And is there anything else out there that we don't see? Now, over time, we've come up with a couple means to address this. We use these together. We answer it like this. Exploration. We try to see more all the time. We've developed instruments, we've developed tools which allow us to expand our vision. Telescopes to look out, microscopes to look in, and we travel everywhere that we possibly can. So we expand what we can see. But in addition to that, we have extrapolation. We try to figure out what's beyond. What else is there? We've developed 
methods over time, mathematics, science, formulas, that allow us to go beyond what we actually see uh, physically. Over time, we've developed tools to allow us to look out into the heavens to see more. These tools give us better and better precision. They use things beyond light. In fact, we've gone so far that we even now, very recently, were able to use our ears to note waves in the space-time of the universe that started way, way back in time. We can actually hear the ripples of space-time. We also like to look in, in more detail. Maybe we want to see Eva's hair a little bit better. We've developed microscopes. We've learned how to use other things besides photons, besides light, to be able to probe inside matter. This is an electron microscope. We also have developed these devices. <laughs> this device, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, right now is probing at the, the, the deepest depths that we possibly can at the moment. And that's where we're at at the moment. That's where we're trying to solve things. What have we learned from all this? Well, in looking out, we've learned that we live on a beautiful little blue planet. It's one of eight or nine planets. Uh, revolving around a sun, it's a pretty normal sun, sitting on the, in the suburbs of a wonderful galaxy that's one of a hundred million, hundred, excuse me, hundred billion galaxies uh, all over, I got that one, one of a hundred billion stars in a galaxy that's one of a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. I don't want to cut it short by several orders of magnitude. Anyway, We've also learned about time. We've learned how we've evolved that the universe started in a big bang 13.8 billion years ago, and that our universe that we're in is expanding. I'm going to get back to that. Looking in, we can see the depths of the hair, for example. Uh, inside, there are our, our cells. The cells are made of molecules. Molecules are made of atoms. Atoms have nuclei, the nuclei have protons and neutrons, and now we know the protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. In fact, we've gone so far that we have a very nice model, something that was drawn up in the 1960s, but now which we completely mapped out and filled out today, something we call the standard model, for lack of a better name. Okay, there's the standard model. You see the particles, but you also see an equation, that equation tells you how those particles interact. So that's what we can see. There's still some things that remain. Remember, 96% remains. Let's take a look at that. Back to the beer, because I figured you guys were going to get back to the beer at some point. Uh, the 73%, that's something that we call dark energy or invisible energy. This is something when we measure the rate at which galaxies or clusters are moving away from each other. We have found fairly recently that it's not just that the universe is expanding, but that expansion is accelerating. Things are going further and further away from each other more quickly. We can calculate how much matter there is out there and then calculate how much energy it would take to do that. You guys all know energy is matter e equals mc squared. So how much energy does it take to push everything out at the rate it's going, to, to accelerate it. That turns out to be about 73% of our universe, dark energy. Another enigma that we have. We look at galaxies. A great astronomer named Vera Rubin uh, noted this. Uh, she figured, oh, galaxies, they must work just like the solar system. The planets in the solar system, you can look at how fast they turn around. They turn around fairly quickly towards the center, but on the outside, they're going more slowly. You can calculate all that. I'm sure you guys all know how to calculate all that. Classical mechanics can be done. You expect exactly the same thing from galaxies. It's not at all the case. The stars on the outside galaxies move too quickly for what you would expect. And the only way that Vera could calculate the, the movement was if she added more matter. In fact, it took 80% more. So out there, in a galaxy and also in, in space in general, 
There is 80% of our matter which is stuff that we can't see. It's been called dark matter or invisible matter. We don't know what that is. And a third enigma. Of this matter, whether you see it or not, every single fundamental particle gets its mass somehow. Now, this is a strange thing. A fundamental particle, you may have seen them visualized as, as like this red ball here. They're actually pointless. They're, um, they're pointless. That's a bad way to put it. They're actually point, they're point particles. They don't have a volume, yet they have a mass. That's a very, very strange thing. How does something which doesn't have a volume have a mass? We didn't understand that. Okay? It doesn't make sense. And they have different masses. How do you explain that? Okay, who knows which of these enigma have been solved? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Which one of these enigma has already been solved? It was solved, uh, you know. The last one, on July 4th, 2012, we celebrated the fact that a proposal that was made in 1964 by Peter Higgs, Francois Angler, Robert Crook, was correct. They proposed that there exists a field everywhere called, commonly called the Higgs field, and a particle that we discovered at the time called the Higgs boson is the carrier of the force of that field, and this explained how things get messed. But, a discovery is great, and of course we enjoyed it when we celebrated, but it was much more important than that. This particle, this field, has a very important property. It is the key to unlocking the, another enigma. The reason for this is that if you look at, very carefully at the arrow next to his beard, there's a lot of beer in this, uh, next to his beard, you'll see that the Higgs boson comes with all particles of mass, right? Dark matter is dark, and it's matter. It has mass. Therefore, if we can measure that particle very carefully, maybe we can solve it. So let's, let's work on that. You can see here, of course, for those of you who are used to looking at uh, Lagrangians and equations in physics, the bottom two lines of this formula carry that Higgs field in it. And they tell us that all massive particles will interact with the Higgs field. So there's a key here, there's something that can help us out. So let's solve this, okay? I mean, as long as we're here, before lunch, try to get some, it's always good to get something done before lunch. Let's solve the enigma. <laughs> we're gonna use something called the Large Hadron Collider. It collides protons together. A lot of people think of it as, oh, you're smashing stuff together to look at what's inside. It's not exactly quite right. What we're trying to do is we squeeze these particles as close as possible <coughs> together at high energy so that they can have a chance to interact. And at the points where we make them go right next to each other, we put these big, beautiful detectors. This is the, the Atlas vector. I'm very biased because I work for Atlas, but there are four beautiful detectors uh, on the LHC, and they're at the points where we make these, these collisions. And what happens when they collide is you see something like this. This is a fairly recent uh, image that we took when we had our, our first our proton collisions at, uh, at 13 TeV that started last year. It's gonna start up again in a few weeks when they start doing a lot of this. What we do is we look at what comes out when there's the collision. We look at the different types of particles and the numbers that come out of that. Now, anybody know Heisenberg? Ever hear of him, Heisenberg? Heisenberg told us that there's a little area Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us a little area that we'll never see. No matter how beautiful of a detector we make, no matter how powerful of an accelerator we make, there's a little area. Can you see it in there? There's a little, little, little black area, and inside that area, we will never really know what's going on. But that's the trick. That's really the trick, is thinking about what goes inside there. This is what the extrapolation part is, the theory part, we often call it extrapolation. Theory. Theorists are allowed in that small black area, but experimentalists like myself, we just measure what comes out. We try to figure out what's going on. So I'm gonna give you a little idea. We're gonna zoom in on that. I happen to bring it right here. What's interesting about this, what's interesting about this box, which I took right out of the beam, expanded it a bit, um, is that the entire universe is inside here. Absolutely everything is inside this box. Anything that can happen, happens. That's what quantum field theory is. You didn't expect to learn quantum field theory, but you're, you're going to now. <laughs> everything, everything happens inside here. 
So particles interact. Those rules that I put up there before of the standard model is what we thought for a long, long time is what happens in here, but that only explains 4% of the universe, right? So what we hope is something else. Let me give you an example. Let me just show you here. I brought a few particles. So let's start with this. Here's the Higgs boson. I happen to get one. We actually have a, a few thousand of these. It's a quadrillions of collisions. By the way, I don't even quadrillions is 10 to the whatever. It's really a big number. You need a lot, a lot of collisions in order to produce some of these Higgs bosons. But that never stopped us. We like to do this stuff. The physicists. So the Higgs boson couples, when we say couples, it interacts with, with other particles. So here, actually. Let's call this, this guy, here's the Higgs boson. Here's another particle. That particle gets its mass by interacting with the Higgs boson. We make a whole bunch of these things. We call these vertices. All of these are explained with that formula. We have a whole bunch of different, different vertices, different connections that we're allowed to make. And that's what the model tells us. And this is supposed to explain what comes out of the box. All we see is stuff sticking out of this box. And we have to, from that, extrapolate, go inside and figure out what stuff's in there. Now, here's the key. This is where the enigma gets interesting because what we hope is this darker stuff here, this dark matter, well, if we have something that's stable and that's massive and it's a fundamental particle, it will interact with the Higgs boson. So by measuring this guy, now we've got it. Now we've got it. Okay, we've had it for three, almost four years now. We've got that Higgs boson. By measuring a lot of interactions, okay, we will be able to see something which goes beyond what we thought was inside that box. There will be something that will change it. We will see different proportions of particles that come out, or something. Something will surprise us, and it will break the rules. At least that's our hope. So to get back to the question that was asked, how do you measure what you can't see? First of all, you imagine. You imagine what's inside that box. Okay? Secondly, hold on a second. I know you're <laughs> then we explore. We explore as best as we can, with the best tools we possibly can, and we have to have a lot of patience. We might be able to find something this year. We're going to have a lot of collisions this year in the LHC. It might take the full 20 years we're going to be running. It might take the next, the next accelerator. But you have to explore, explore, explore. And finally, when you're lucky, you break the rules. So. I, I think when I, when I looked out in the audience, I saw a little bit of doubt from people when I said the entire universe was in this box. And I think that it's very important that everybody here know that you should never, ever, ever doubt a TEDx speaker. <laughs> the universe is in the box. <laughs>